It's about not balance like symmetry, but balance like weight and like where are you in that plumb line. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Devers and this is Clever. Today I'm talking to John Sorensen Jolink. These days, John is a lighting designer and founder of design studio Coil and Drift. But in his previous career, he was a professional contemporary dancer. He earned his BFA at the Conservatory at New York University's Tisch School and went on to perform with legendary choreographers and directors such as Robert Wilson, Lucinda Childs, Doug Elkins, and Twyla Tharp. After spending 10 years as a dancer, largely on the road touring with productions and living out of a suitcase, John began to crave something a bit more tangible and rooted. Learning to design and make objects was a natural extension of his creative practice and quickly became a new passion. He founded Coil and Drift in 2016 and has been garnering attention and accolades ever since, including the ICFF Editor's Award for Best New Designer in 2016, and inclusion on Sight Unseen's 2018 American Design Hot List. In 2022, Coil and Drift relocated from Brooklyn to the majestic Catskill Mountains and opened a new studio, showroom, and facility where they now produce everything in-house. His dancer's sensibility comes through in the work itself, as it manages to capture the grace and movement of light and air, while simultaneously conveying an honest, earthbound materiality. Talking to John, I'm struck by just how balanced and grounded he is. Maybe this is exactly the reason he's been able to soar, both literally and figuratively, through a wild and adventurous life and never lose his center. Here's John. I'm John Sorensen Jolink, and I am in Jeffersonville, New York, which is in the Western Catskills. And I'm a lighting designer for Coil and Drift, which is my company, and we design lighting grounded in human connection. And what that means to me is that this obsession with home that I've had for a long time is really just about how objects can influence and energize the spaces that we would have it, and, and maybe even us, and how that can influence how we relate to each other. I love that. That is right up my alley. So I can't wait to get into that. But in order to understand how you got obsessed with this, I need to know what you were like as a kid. So let's go all the way back to Portland, Oregon, and tell me about your childhood, (laughs) your family dynamic, and the things that captured your imagination. Okay. So yes, I grew up in Portland before Portland was like cool, (laughs) um, I guess, although I thought it was pretty cool. I was a kid who kind of, I was obsessed with doing everything. I wanted to try everything. I think my parents encouraged me to try everything, maybe as a reaction to having like very focused, strict upbringings themselves. So they were really down with me, like doing a lot of different things. Okay. Clarifying question. Siblings? I have one sister. I'm the youngest. Yeah. She's four years older than I am. Okay. And were they down with her doing everything too? Yeah, definitely. Although we're very different. So our interests were very different. I mean, she was like a reader, just devoured books. And so before I knew how to read, I thought it was just something that she did when she wasn't playing with me. <laughs> so I remember it was my, my parents had to work really hard to get me into reading. And finally it, it worked. But yeah, we're both very different. Four years older, you said your parents had pretty rigid upbringings. How would you characterize that? Just a different generation or was there? I think just a different generation, yeah. Okay. What was expected of them was that they would, you know, have one career and it was probably a couple of options. And especially for my mom, you know, as, as many women, like, there maybe wasn't so much of a career focus. And she did something that I see now as very rebellious, which was that she went to university and she ran away from Portland and became a Pan Am flight attendant and then a purser. So she was one of the bosses for the hiring of the whole Western Hemisphere for Pan Am. So she's been to every country in the world. She speaks multiple languages and then ended up ultimately Pan Am 
put her through law school. So damn, that's quite a role model. And, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. None of which I think was in her parents' plan. I mean, I imagine that they did not have that in mind for her. Okay. Well, I love that you got to see that. It also sounds like there is a wild streak that we're going to have to discuss somewhere. <laughs> totally. <laughs> totally. There's this feeling of like, try everything. It comes from really from both of them. My dad was also okay. adventurous. They met in law school in Oregon. You know, my dad left Minnesota where he grew up in a tiny little town and had been accepted to a couple schools and, and left in his car to drive from one to the other and decide where he was going to live. That was wow. how that was how he chose, and he got to Oregon, and it was like just so beautiful outside of you know the landscape outside of Portland. You have a mountain an hour away, you have the ocean an hour away, you have the desert an hour away. It's just like rainforest. It's it's absolutely spectacular landscape, and he just couldn't go anywhere else. So that's how he ended up in Oregon. I like this adventurous spirit and wild streak that's turning up, but it starts off with you, at least, with a, a kind of willingness to let you try everything and find maybe what was interesting to you. And, and as a kid, what were those things? Where were you going? So I was like a very serious violinist. From what age did you pick up the violin? Oh, like four. Oh. That was very early. Oh, so did they have a tiny violin? Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's many, adorable. Many of them, because I think you like <laughs> okay. you rent them when you're that little because okay. you need a new one. I mean, you look, I'm yeah. very tall, so <laughs> I was just growing like crazy. And uh, yeah, many, many cute little violins. Okay, but from four years old, you had a kind of seriousness about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I played, I studied privately and played in a youth symphony in Portland. And yeah, I, I was very serious. Music is like very much a part of my childhood and my family. So I think at that point, I just was enjoying it, I had no, no intention to, to do it as a career. You didn't have that figured out at four years old? No, no, nor <laughs> did I, at, you know, 10 or 12. Okay, um, good. I was just like, that's fair <laughs> into it. And I think back now and like, what was the most challenging thing for me about studying music was how much time alone you have to spend. You have to practice for four or five hours a day, so before school, after school, which was a lot for me as a kid to do. I wanted to be around other people. So I think eventually that was... I, I was also drawn to sports, so I played soccer, and that kind of gave me the, the kind of group fix that I craved. Oh, good. And was it a close family? Yeah, we had some struggles with mental health growing up that meant that we were probably closer than many families because we needed to be. So my sister and I are very close. I, I know I started out by saying we're very different, but we're also very, very close. And and I'm also have been very close with my parents um, and continue to be. Okay. So I'm seeing a kid who's serious about violin, but also playing soccer close with his sister and supported in finding whatever your curiosity is leading you towards. There's this moment in childhood where you start to sort of feel impending adulthood. And sometimes it happens early adolescence. Sometimes you stave it off as long as you can. Where are you on that spectrum? So I think it happened when I found dance, which ultimately became my, my first career. And so that was when I was 12. I was at a public school in a middle school, and we were given the option to not take physical education classes if we took a dance class at the school instead. And so I thought that would be fun. And I tried it and totally loved it, but just because it was fun. But then at the end of the year, the teacher came to me and said, we're actually part of a feeder program with this performing arts high school that's public. And we think you should go there, but we think you should go in your eighth grade year when you're still in middle school. And so I was like, what? <laughs> and I was like, okay. 
so yeah, I fell deep into dance very quickly. My eighth grade year, I would go to academics at my middle school in the morning. And then I would, my parents would call a cab because they both worked and drive me from one side of the city to the other side of the city to the afternoon where I would dance all afternoon. And that was my first year. I had no idea what I was doing, but I just loved dancing. Okay, I have so many questions. First of all, did it feel good to be singled out like this? And did it click for you that you were excelling in something so much so that that teachers took notice and started to sort of advise you on maybe how you could accelerate? I think that was part of it at that age. Like, I think that that felt really good to me at that time to be this kid that had done a lot of things well. Mm -hmm. But I think maybe because I was doing so many of them, it wouldn't happen often that someone would say, oh my God, that was so amazing. I think it was one of the first times someone had said like, this is just natural for you to be a dancer. Like you should do this. And I was like, wow. And, and I, and I think I just totally went with it. Like it felt right at the time. Okay. I love this already. I also need to know at some point horses started featuring prominently in your life. Can you yeah, tell me about so, that? <laughs> <laughs> thank you for asking because <laughs> they're a big part of my life. No, this was, this was the whole time. This the was, whole time. Okay. Yeah. This was part of the beginning of like very, very young experiences with horses and then it just continued first by me going to summer camp for horses to for riding when I was very young, maybe like six or seven. And then I started working at that camp. And then I started working at the ranch that this camp was on. And there's no other way to describe it, but that I was horse crazy. I just loved them. I loved the experience. It makes a lot of sense from a dance perspective because you are, you know, it's all about your maintaining your plumb line, which we talk about like the vertical line through your spine of, of like gravity, mm -hmm. like riding a horse. If you're going to stay on is about balance and you, and, and experiencing that plumb line, like and extended through the horse as well. And dance is a lot about that as well. So, and, and then I really did stop riding, I think, maybe mid high school until last year it was a combination of it just being like the amount of time that was required to train to be a dancer. My summers were suddenly taken by intensives that I would attend for the whole summer. Like you're, you're expected to just keep training for the whole summer and not take time off. And it's, yeah, it sounds a little bit like training for the Olympics or something. A little like bit. A pro athlete. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah I think so. It, there's a lot about dance that's athletic and like being an athlete. And yet dancers also hate being called athletes because there's so much of a kind of creative element involved. But yeah, it's definitely a combination of art and athleticism. As you're getting better and better at dance and probably finding your creative voice within it, is this also your primary social scene? Totally. And this is the thing that like drew me in more than anything except the actual like experience of moving and performing. I loved this community and we had this community of kids studying dance seriously. It was a pre-professional company that they created at the school. So you really felt like you were in a dance company, even though you weren't being paid so we would go around Portland and, and sometimes go on tour as well and perform. And this dance company, in quotes, existed since like the early 70s. It's like a very, it's a Portland institution. So I knew when I was told that I should go study at this school that that's where this company was. It was very prestigious. Okay. So I was excited. But yeah, totally. The, we probably were like 20 kids and we were super, super close. The other thing I should mention about this school is that it's 98% black. So oh, I was that is important. very, and I'm a six foot two white person. Um, <laughs> so I, I was very much aware that I stuck out from a young age. Yeah. But also like immersed in a, a group of people that I, that became my family and 
Yeah. It just happened that a lot of them didn't look like me, but that didn't matter. We were, we were required to study African dance um, as well as tap and jazz and ballet and modern dance. So it was a very well-rounded program, but I always, I always, you know, I could show you some great images of African dance costumes on me. It was, (laughs) uh, it was pretty fabulous. That sounds like a really magical experience. I mean, it is so important when you're that age to get a kind of recognition and to find, to grab onto something that you're truly good at, that you enjoy. And I want to get to, you know, you went to NYU to Tisch School and got a BFA and excelled there as well. Was there any teen angst or rebellion or awkwardness that you had to sort of fit into in terms of making the transition? Totally. So I left high school a year early when I was 17 and went to New York immediately terribly homesick. Mm, it's a big change. Yeah. And, and quickly after a month, like found that the dance department was going to be my family that like, I, I hated the dance department after the first year I wanted to leave. And I certainly did not think it was the right place for me. I, I applied to a couple of other schools in Europe and I was ready to go to one of them. And I think that was about ego. And when you talk about rebelliousness, I remember, I just seemed so young at that time. Mm -hmm. I remember just thinking, these people, I mean, have no idea. Like, I am going to be on Broadway, you know? Like, (laughs) (laughs) Like, that's what I thought my goal was. I mean, it's totally wasn't by the end of school, but, but that was my going out of high school. I was like, yeah, I could be in cats. Like that would be succeeding. You know, what really exists for most people are project-based contracts. So you will work with a choreographer who is, you know, maybe super cutting edge, like doing really interesting work and, and still they don't have enough money to have a full-time dance company. I mean, that's like, a quite a quite a huge budget to to mm-hmm. pay people and so that they end up hiring you for three months and it culminates in a show or maybe a tour and mm-hmm. then you're on to the next job so one of my big, biggest and to this day criticisms of nyu was that it really prepared us for a life as a full-time company dancer which again is like exists but it's a very small percentage and most dancers doesn't matter your expertise or like how good or famous you are, are doing project-based work. Thankfully, I had a lot of full-time work when I was dancing. Tell me about that. I don't know what it's like to dance, like go on tour as a dancer. That yeah. sounds... Well, I, I danced with like probably 20 different choreographers and companies over 10 years. Some of the big ones too? Yeah, some big ones. So I danced for Twyla Tharp, who is like kind of one of the foremost living postmodern dance choreographers and is known for kind of moving modern dance and ballet into the same world. I danced in the show called Sleep No More, which is still exists in New York City. I was in the original cast. I danced with Lucinda Childs and Robert Wilson, which Lucinda Childs also one of the founding kind of mavens of postmodern dance still alive. And I'm picturing a very itinerant kind of way of life. The life of a dancer is you're moving a lot, you're touring, you're flying on planes, you're traveling. And for me, the thing that I loved that kept me going was performing. I loved being on stage and I loved the camaraderie of being on stage with other people and like presenting this work. It was just like, still to this day, there's nothing like it. I'm super interested. I know I can see your dance creative process and probably even the movement of your plumb line and horses in your, now your objects, your lighting and furniture. But how would you describe your creative process as a dancer? I mean, there's a lot of practice, there's a lot of training, but if we were to get really into the 
sort of poetics of what it is you were good at and you felt like you were expressing? What was that? Mm. So I think it, it, there's a couple answers because I worked for each choreographer is expecting something different and it's about their process as well. Yes. But what I was really drawn to was when we were given the opportunity to kind of live within a role and and kind of create a world within that role. And then at the same time, when we were also given feedback and structure within that experience, that was kind of the sweet spot. So sometimes you would walk into a room and and you'd be given choreography and it was like, you must do exactly this. And that's its own challenge, but not, not so amazing. And sometimes you're, you go into a, a, a studio with a choreographer and they say, I'm going to improvise and I want you to learn my improvisation on the spot. And then you improvise and you learn your Im- improvisation and then we'll make a dance. And then you'll, you go to the, you know, first performance and you see the program and none of the dancers are credited, even though most of the movement was made up by the dancers. And that's common. And so again, I think the sweet spot is a little bit of, and it, this is the same for me in design. Like I, I love having structure and parameters given to me and then to be creative within that. I think for me, Sleep No More was like the ultimate um, world because we were, it was, we were really doing a lot of creation when we were making the show. I mean, it's a very unique show that happens in a six-story building and the audience moves through the building following the performers who are all dancers as we dance the story of Macbeth. So it's a very specific show and really beautiful also can be kind of terrifying we created a lot of that movement and yet the two directors are very good at giving feedback, shaping, structuring, and, and making you feel like your decisions are valid or they need to change. This isn't working. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was for me, I think one of the most beautiful processes creatively. Okay. So 10 years of that lifestyle sounds both really formative, really magical, also very difficult, can erode at you a bit if you're living out of a suitcase and have a lot of short-term relationships. At some point, you decide that you need something less ephemeral and more tangible. Can you talk to me about that reconciliation within yourself and what you chose to do about it? Totally. So I think it was like 2011. I was in the dressing room and sleep no more. And I was looking around and thinking, God, these artists that I'm performing with are all so incredible. Some of them are 10 years older than I am. We're at the top of our game, like Beyonce's coming to see the show. It was like very hot when it first opened. You know, we were all feeling really great. And and I thought to myself, like, I, I think I want something else. And it's like, it, I think it takes being at that place sometimes to be like, hmm, yeah, this is super fulfilling. And I think I want something else. And I think I wanted something more in multiple ways. One was financially, I could, we were all paid the same rate in Sleep No More. And I just saw myself like in 10 years and I knew that I had more ambitions and wanted to be able to like own a home and those things. And it wasn't going to happen if I was going to continue to be the kind of dancer that I was. So something needed to to change. And at the same time, I was always, but it was kind of bubbling up at that moment, curious about running my own company. I wanted to be, I wanted to start something and make something. And I remember thinking maybe it's a dance company. Maybe it's a choreographic practice where I'm working as a choreographer But slowly over the course of like three years, I found myself in a woodworking kind of class because I wanted to use my hands to make something. I had this idea that dance was so ephemeral and I I wanted to, to, like you said, kind of hold something that I made. And that's not something that was new. I was obsessed with making things when I was little. Mm. You know, I would build like 
epic tree houses. I remember we had like five of them, like 30 feet in the air in my backyard, which was quite large in Oregon. So it wasn't new. I wanted to go back, if I'm honest, to this kind of tangible practice and kind of dive more deeply into it. I didn't know that that would be a career, but I started taking some woodworking classes and like just fell deeply in love with the the practice of making things. You have a pattern of trying new things and being really good at it. Please tell me about a failure. Please. please. No, no. I, <laughs> thank you. Um, that's very kind of you. I have plenty of failures. <laughs> I mean, if I'm honest, I'm not an amazing woodworker. I was more excited about exploring that. Yeah. And I never went as deep as I could have gone to really be like a craftsperson in wood. I was too excited about designing. So that's how I, it was, it was a vehicle to get into the world of design. It was very clear to me that I was not going to become a woodworker that had that be my career. And if we're thinking about tangibility, I wanted something to last. I didn't want to just make something and trash it. I wanted to have an object for a long time. So it wasn't that I was a bad woodworker. It's just that I wasn't geeking out in the way that I know people that do. Yes, I do too. (laughs) I love the process of making things because it's so embodied. And there is a sort of physicality, a fluidity of movement. Your body needs to work in concert with the material and the machine and all of that. There, It is sort of a dance on the shop floor. 100%. It was very clearly choreographic. It's movement. I remember thinking that I didn't know anything and that I was constantly feeling like lost in this world of design, which was both terrifying and very exciting. But I also remember thinking to myself, you are are using all of your dance knowledge here and choreographic knowledge. Like, this is all the same thing. They're just different terms, different practices. And once you learn those terms, it's fine. You can you need to learn how to speak with this community, but you already know mm-hmm. how to use your body in this way. And also how to work really diligently, how to work independently, how to take criticism. All of those things are heavily from dance. Yeah. And... How did your confidence develop in terms of you as a designer? Was it your own eye that you were tuning? Were you Uh, getting into a critical discourse kind of community? Yeah, I, well, I don't think I had a lot of confidence for a long time. I knew that I was excited about what I was doing, self-driven excitement of like the newness and the creative expression. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if anyone else enjoyed it. I remember feeling like I couldn't really even ask people because I didn't have the language to talk about it yet. And I didn't want to feel like a fool. So this was where I was, you know, clearly I could talk to you for days about dance history and all of the different work that I was inspired by. And why does this look like this and the origins of things. And I knew nothing about the history of design. So I just kind of like, withheld myself from from really being out in the world for a while because I just I felt like I didn't know enough to really put myself out there then it also was a bit of imposter syndrome which I think we all struggle with sure especially young designers and that that continued for a long time feeling just like I was a fraud sure but let's just put this in perspective because 2011 you're on sleep no more you have this recognition that you might need to make some adjustments in your life. You open Coil and Drift, your own company, your own design studio in 2016. That's only five years. Yeah, it was So in five years, you you taught yourself design and fabrication and you got to a place where you wanted to do your own studio. Um, So imposter syndrome or not, that's still a fast track. No, I think that it's important for like young people to know that these are all possible at the same time. You can feel kind of like a fraud and also be like thrilled by your experiences at the same time. Yeah. Like life is complicated. I was thinking about this period recently and realizing that like it was so not linear. Like I didn't go from one thing to the next thing. I was dancing 
I worked for a, a Dutch bicycle importer to try to learn how to run a business for a year in that four year period. And I was working at Makeville Studios, like kind of figuring out how to how to make things. I was selling some some things on Etsy. And I was like at the same time traveling with Einstein on the beach like every three months going to different places all over the world. So like it was all happening at once. It was a very exciting time and very thrilling and also just like completely weird and unknown because even though dance was a difficult career that you often would need to find work, you know, you have projects that would end. I was consistently employed for 10 years and like I was comfortable and knew how to make my living. And I was in this period where I was like trying to figure out something new and didn't really know how to do it. I mean, I look at young designers now that I meet and they're like, oh yeah, I'm looking for an internship or, or I would like to apprentice. I had no idea that that was an option. So... <laughs> Yeah. And that's the thing that I'm so infinitely and unendingly fascinated by is that people who are compelled to create find a way there almost out of sheer will and need. And whether that's through art school or like, you know, through a different creative modality or completely kismet, you know, all are incredibly valid. Totally. You'll find your way there eventually if this is what you need to do. Yeah. Hundred percent. There are moments for everyone where you don't know if you're gonna make it, and and I think some people decide what whatever you choose at that point is whatever you choose. So, at, for whatever reason, during those five years, I was just on like a, a bender of pushing through new things and figuring stuff out. If I think about it now, I'm like, this is also the period that I met my now husband. You know, like a lot was happening at that time that was like exciting and new. That is wonderful. And it does sound like that was an incredible period of life. You know, love coming into your life along with this new love of design. And you really consciously developing your agency around a business practice and a creative practice that is grounded in objects. I want to talk about Coil and Drift because... I want to know, like, the origin story of you finally pulling the trigger on your own creative studio and then how you would describe your evolution from 2016 to now. So during that five-year period, I, I would take projects, building things and designing things. So I was doing kind of what dancers often do, project-based work in the design world because it's kind of what I knew. And then after... I had built up enough of my own designs that I kind of felt confident enough that I could look at these pieces and say, yeah, they're ready to, to show to the world. I had a studio that was in a shared wood shop. So it was like renting bench space. And mm -hmm. I started working with a couple outside fabricators. It started to become clear to me that the designs that I was making over those years were more and more complicated and more and more interesting if I had someone else who was really skilled build them. So when Coil and Drift launched in 2016, it was at ICFF. It was the smallest booth possible in the back. And I think about half of the pieces that I showed, I had made myself and half had been made by a woodworker that I had become close to. And yeah, it was the start of a, the studio. It was the start of a period of creating and putting things out into the world under this brand and like kind of creating the identity of something new of Coil and Drift, which very early on I knew would be material forward. Mm -hmm. I wasn't interested in disguising or like painting things. I wanted the material to be recognizable for what it was. And I knew that the way that these forms were taking shape three-dimensionally had to do with my understanding of, of form and movement from my dance background. I didn't exactly know how, but it was I knew it was about negative space. And a lot of the work that I was making was 
something that would kind of change shape as you moved around it. Yeah. I'm thinking of like the geometric desk coffee table that's no longer in the collection, but we made for many years that really like looked like a different piece depending on where you saw it from. And there's still work in the collection that that's like that. I think that that identity remains, but it was, yeah, it was about creating, putting things out there. If I'm really looking at it from, for the first couple of years, it wasn't so much about building systems and an infrastructure in, in that way of talking about a company. It was about introducing this thing to the world. Hey, that's what you're doing in a production. Totally. Yeah. Now it's coming together. The theatricality. I was putting on yes. a show. And I still I still am. But yes. And it's all I knew. So each time we would launch something, you know, you look at the the earlier collections and it's like a chair maybe one or two lights, a side table. And none of them had been like fleshed out in different iterations. The lighting wasn't like sconces, pendants, chandeliers. I was creating little worlds, which I still think is a kind of fun Mm -hmm. way to approach it. It's not very useful from a standpoint of like, you're thinking about your clients because an interior designer will see a sconce and say, hey, can we do that as a floor lamp. And if you don't make one, (laughs) then it's a custom order. And that's, you know, there's only so many times you're like, okay. (laughs) Enter me kind of learning how to actually operate a company, which, which was the next phase. But yeah, at the beginning, it was just putting on shows. And shows you did. I mean, the Unconscious Forms show was literal mix of your collection with choreography and totally to stunning effects. So that was 2018. And I really think that's the, the culmination of the, like putting on shows as a way of being a design studio. We, that spring did four shows between March, April, and May. We did collective design, remember collective, Mm -hmm. which was so fun. And we had two, live dancers performing in the booth once a day. So if you happen to be there when it, we would never tell anyone when it happened, then you could see it. And that was really special. And then we made a film with those dancers. This was all including the new collection and about the new collection, but the dancers were literally using these objects to dance with. I think the film is still up on our website. You can find it. But the film was then showed in a gallery context on three screens in Soho. And we made three iterations of our Soar and Cher that were like exaggerated objects of art that we also showed in that context. And then we also did the AD show and ICFF that year. <laughs> and by the end of that spring, I was just completely exhausted and fully like performed out. I had like taken it to its natural conclusion Mm -hmm. and without really realizing it at the time, I went searching for a new, like a, a new understanding of how to operate a business sustainably. And it turns out that, you know, that original seed of like being curious about running a business Mm -hmm. as well. I mean, that was real. And so when I started to dive into leadership and business entrepreneurship and how other people have experienced it and the wisdom that people have learned, I mean, I just started eating it up and I'm still eating it up. I mean, it's, it's a whole other world of, of kind of magic that, that people are discovering every day. I mean, there's a new book to read every day and I'm reading them all. (laughs) Anyway, so yeah, so it started after that insane 2018 year. We did get a lot of recognition from those four shows and we've always had like a healthy amount of press, I would say, but it's not just natural. We've always worked very hard to have a healthy amount of press and to represent ourselves well. I think I've always done my own PR That is something that has struck me about the way that you run the brand is you sort of understand all of the ancillary mechanisms. In order to get a healthy amount of press, you also understand you need good photography, you need to develop relationships with the people who are writing the articles. And that's something Coil and Drift, I think, has done really well without just being 
self-promotional. It's It feels very organic to the way you operate. It also feels like you're doing it with a sort of dancer's fluidity. <laughs> mm, thank you. Yes. So I think that independent designers in the U.S., by and large, are often trying to just tell a story. And like, that is what is interesting about what we're doing. We're, you know, we're making interesting new work and telling a story. And press is just introducing that story to more people and saying like, hey, do you want to come along and like see this and be a part of this? Mm -hmm. So my strategy has just always been to continue to like understand the story that we're trying to tell, which I mean, well, we've had a number of really beautiful pieces written about the connection between dance and design and how that is kind of manifested in Coil and Drift's work. And I still have to remind myself that like, that's not flushed out yet. There's more yeah. that we could say. People want to talk about, it's, this is weird. It's interesting. You know, it's not common. So it's a story that people want to talk about just because I live that every day doesn't mean it's done. Right. So I think that that's, that's what works. Tell your story and be personal. That's been our experience with media, but I did need to find a way to kind of holistically run the business where we could really have like a healthy profit and sustain ourselves and, and start to think about like future, like visioning and goals. And that's how I found my way into an ongoing relationship with a, a business consultant and with her guidance, kind of creating a community of like advisors around Coil and Drift that I'm constantly going to, to help us like shape and understand how we run the, the business now. And that's the kind of phase from 2018 to where we are now is like slowly chipping away at those goals. And um, the first goal was start learning. And then here we are today where we have like moved the business out of the city. I have personally moved out of the city. We live in a rural setting upstate. We have a 3000 square foot studio and we build all of our own lights, which was not the case when the studio was in New York. We worked with a fabricator. So your team is growing and your showroom is exquisite and you've made the shift, I think, from the city to the Catskills, you need to tell me what precipitated that shift and also how is it influencing the work that comes out of Coil and Drift? Yeah. So the what took us out of the city is, if I'm really pulling back and honest, it's the desire to be back at that ranch that I grew up working at. It's I and it wasn't just the ranch. Like I spent a lot of time outside as a kid. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, Oregon is just a natural landscape. So there's a lot of space and a lot of wildness. And I needed that. And I didn't allow myself to think about that when I was dancing because I had to be based in New York City if I was going to be an American dancer. And I love New York City. I mean, I, I was there for 20 years and I have no bad feelings about the city, but I really craved a kind of different life and space and being close to nature and being able to be outside. So my husband and I bought a tiny little house. We actually bought it just before the pandemic, which was just a totally lucky decision. Yeah in terms of timing, because the real estate costs have gone up so much now. But we we bought it for not a lot of money. And it's, it's a very ugly small house on a lot of land uh -huh. that I immediately went to, you know, started renovating myself when the pandemic hit. So that was also, you know, something to do when we were all locked down. But it was going to be a weekend house. That was going to be my connection to the to the land, which would have been wonderful. Of course, I think like a lot of people, like the the moment that I spent all of my time here during the pandemic, I was like, how do we do this? How do we not spend time in the city as much? So the conversation started <laughs> and, you know, it's today it's possible because of flexibility on a lot of fronts. My husband works three days a week in the city and then spends the rest of his time up here and we 
also made a very smart, inexpensive real estate purchase in the city many years ago in Flatbush. And so we moved to a less popular neighborhood and bought an apartment and that allowed us to buy this place upstate. So we've made two good real estate decisions. That's the the truth of why this is all possible. Now, here we are. It sounds like you've had a bit of luck, but you've also had a lot of intentionality in forming a lot of your choices. For sure. And it does seem like you're in your happy place. Yeah. Your work is grounded in human connection and materiality. The materials themselves are not camouflaged in any way. They're just very honest. Yeah. And so much about what makes your work feel like it's so light and has so much movement is because of the way the negative space is considered within the object. I think it's even more about space because it's a different kind of space up here and, and negative space definitely plays into it. So yes, we just launched our new collection, which is called Loon and it's only lighting. It's eight fixtures. Um, broken up into two families. And it's a complete product of this place. Really? It's a, it's, it's a collection of, of the Catskills for me, of, of this first moment. And I'm imagining that it will develop and future collections will also be influenced by this place. But this is like the, the first, you know, and it will always be the first. So the first family is called Ridge and it's a kind of exploration in different iterations of this, what looks like a leaf shape. And we call it ridge because it has this spine down the middle and then they're symmetrical curved sides. It's four different iterations, two sconces, two different size sconces, a chandelier and a huge pendant. And each one is a kind of idea of Looking at this shape, which we originally came to by exploring different seeds of the area. Mm. Seeds, leaves, birds. There are a lot of like similar shapes in those three things. So seeds moved to leaves. Leaves with some of those fixtures moved to birds. And specifically the like downward push of a big wingspan that kind of almost A-shaped, but curved, curved Mm A-shape. And those shapes all influenced these four different iterations. So the giant pendant really looks like a swooping bird from the side. The chandelier, to me, it looks like a, a kind of branch or a tree that is, hasn't had enough water and is just getting like a downpour Mm. and is kind of waking up. Yeah. It's really like a capturing a real specific moment in that that we're familiar with because we've, yeah, we've had a lot of those dry spells and wet spells specifically with the climate change. So, and then the sconces are just kind of like pure studies of that simple curved shape. And then the other part of the collection is this kind of, we call it like a bell shape, but it's also a curved bell shape. So it's like the, we think about the, um, flowers the um trumpet flower that's what they're called sorry so that's that was the the kind of starting point for the foundry collection which we then took this kind of flower delicate flower shape and combined it with this experience of sand casting Mm -hmm. because we have a local forge here in the Catskills that does sand casting and that just felt like so special and underutilized in lighting I hadn't seen many people casting forms for lighting so no and it's it's also the placement is it's interesting because you don't normally hang forged pieces right so there's something so delicate about the form but then when it's cast in such a sturdy material and then suspended it's absolutely striking thank you it, it's extremely heavy as well yeah. <laughs> so like it's really and and Yeah, that's on purpose. And it's, you know, not for everyone because it's heavy. But for me, there's no other way to get that like true heft. And that, like you're saying, the combination of this kind of delicate feeling with this heft is really where this, the sweet spot of this fixture. And it's 
to me has so much to do with dance. It's, you know, it's all about what I think of is like, have you experienced lifting someone who's asleep versus lifting someone who knows they're right about to be lifted? Yeah. Somehow the person who's ready to be lifted is like way lighter. The person who's sleeping is like, oh my God, like I can't, you know, it's like, I can't get you up. And that has to do with like how we support ourselves. And so thinking of scale and weight, seeing this piece that looks like it shouldn't be hanging because it's so heavy, but it hangs perfectly. An image is coming to mind of you getting lower in your plies and Mm -hmm. yet still needing to be aloft Mm -hmm. so easily. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. cause there is a sort of gravity, but it's not a, it's not a weighted gravity as much as it is a a kind of, it's like gravity in motion. Yeah. It's about balance comes into play then. Yeah. It's about not balance, like symmetry, but balance, like how do you, like, where are you in that plumb line and weight and, I don't know, when you said that, it made me think of, like, it's really personal to me. Like, this collection is about, like, it has a kind of melancholiness to it, which is very personal to me. It's, like, kind of the place that I have been in off and on for a couple of years. I I lost my dad a couple of years ago. And it was oh, I'm rough. so sorry. Thank you. He was a fantastic person. Had a totally massive effect on my life but in effect specifically on my creative process and in relation to this conversation like I can look at these fixtures from this collection and see that kind of yeah melancholy feels like the word because it's not sadness Mm -hmm. you know it's not like there's there's real life in these forms but there's something about that when we're talking about weight Yes. That that comes up for me. But it's like the weight of wistfulness or nostalgia. It it's like not a heavy weight. Completely. There's movement in it. Yeah. Yeah. For me, like grief is such a weird thing and you know, it is really always there. But I, we have we've been the opposite of stagnant since this happened. We being the studio myself, you know, we've been really moving and growing and expanding. And so kind of interesting to think about this, like these new creations, almost being like inspired by this feeling of loss in a way, but not in a way that's like directly sad, more in just like, like, how can we like create from this, you know? As as you're saying that, I'm also reminded that when something moves out, something has to move in, right? Like it's the nature of convection. 100%. And if the grief flows through you and there's this convection and what comes forward from that are these beautiful pieces, then that seems to make perfect sense to me. That seems to line up. Mm, Totally. It's like the way that I would want to honor a life, right? Yeah. Without really like thinking about it. And I mean, again, why conversations like this are useful, but um, it's also that, like, I don't think this collection would have been that way if I had said, oh, I'm going to make a collection honoring, you know, him. Like, that's not, it it needed to not be that direct for it to be what it is now. Yeah. Which, you know, I, I should just say, since we were talking about imposter syndrome earlier, that... Yeah, of course, that's still around sometimes. But, like, I love this collection. Good. And that's, like, something that I would not have necessarily said before. So it's, like, a real pleasure to to make work that you enjoy. I don't think it always happens. No, it's, it's you're not always able to get to that real authentic place from which something comes forward. But when you do, and when it's so of yourself, you can't be an imposter there. Do you know what I mean? (laughs) Because it's your offspring. (laughs) Uh, Totally. And and then suddenly, like, it's so much easier to talk to people about. It's so much, you know, it just feels like, right? It also, I mean, there's a big part of this equation that we we built this collection here. Mm -hmm. Like, my team 
did this. And we not only built the finished product, but we went through iterations and iterations and iterations and we prototyped and we did kind of this thing, which I have now been fantasizing about doing since 2018 when I realized that we should probably move the production Mm in-house if we want to really build a company that has like a real voice, a creative voice and really high quality standards and makes really beautiful, extraordinary pieces. And so this is the first time that we've done that from start to finish here. And it feels really great. I have an amazing, amazing employee, Miranda, who is like indispensable in that process. And we're about to hire a new person. So it's going to be really interesting to see how we'd like have kind of planted this foundation of what a creative process could look like that feels really good and like a sustainable systematized company and see that kind of start to grow. Mm -hmm. What's on the horizon for Coil and Drift? So the way I describe the next five years is that Coil and Drift will be a lighting studio that makes a really awesome shelving system. We will have less of our furniture offerings Mm -hmm. and we'll focus very intensely on lighting and our hover shelving system, which is a a kind of shelving system that lives in the world between built-in millwork and a kind of freestanding unit. It feels very built-in. You can move it from space to space. You can reconfigure it, but it has this like very luxurious built-in quality and it's made of really stunning materials. So we, we will always make it and I love it very much. Um, But I think we'll, we will, not make as much furniture but the lighting will just continue because i I really love the process of designing lighting and we've we've gotten very good at making it here so i want to like explore that and flesh that out so that's that's what the studio will look like we will probably be in a, a larger building we will own it and we'll be in the catskills still i have a vision for 10 years of the team being like a maximum of 14 people. I don't really want to go bigger than that. I think it's really important, especially for young people to like, think about what growth means and like how you define growth and don't Mm -hmm. let other people define it for you. So for me, growth means like this, what we've been talking about in terms of like learning and discovering and becoming understanding how to build systems efficiency that's the growth that i want and i don't necessarily want to have a company of like 50 people Mm -hmm. but we'll be more and more profitable we have plans to streamline and make really beautiful fixtures Um, and then there's some sort of I, i want to explore more and more about how coil and drift can collide with hospitality as a vehicle to show new work So I'm kind of thinking about showrooms and a presence in the city and these kind of traditional ways that we would grow and maybe have a little gallery in the city somewhere else in the world as well. And those are all, those are possibilities, but I'm curious about that taking shape in a different way as well. Like, could there be a hospitality component involved in that? Like, you know, if you were, whisked away to the Catskills for, you know, three nights in a beautiful home that was filled with coil and drift work. And that's how you saw the new collection. Mm -hmm. Would, wouldn't that be interesting? And it's, you know, not something that's available on Airbnb. It's like a, some sort of more special experience. I mean, if we're really honest and we really want to get into the the visioning i'm like what if it's on a horse farm like (laughs) (laughs) what if this space is surrounded by horses i mean don't throw out the idea of a horse farm that you have in your head like what if we're talking like an architect designed space really like mind-blowing but Mm -hmm. feels like it lives in the catskills beautifully that's how you come and experience this work so we're we're thinking about that. We're writing. It's in the early stages, but you know, I just said it. So now it has to happen. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm glad you put it out there on this podcast. <laughs> that sounds beautiful. And that also sounds like it's fulfilling on more levels than just work and creativity. But separately from Coil and Drift, more about John and your personal self-actualization. What's your vision for the future? And what is something that you need personally in order to keep growing into your fullest self? The first thing that comes to mind is um, more travel because we, my husband and I, we both find it very difficult to travel because, I mean, it's a great problem to have. We really love where we are. And we also have a dog and a cat that we love very much. And it's <laughs> hard to be away from them, as funny as that sounds. Um, but it's real, so I'll say it. <laughs> But yeah, some some travel would be really, really good for me in the near future. And I don't know, I'm just going to say, so my brother and sister-in-law from France just visited last week and being with someone who's from another country, like it's a massive opportunity. They live on a beautiful small village in the center of France. Like we should spend time there. So yeah, I think I'm going to say my my... What I need is to live, not to live, but to spend more time traveling and maybe spend more time in France and, you know, maybe actually become fluent instead of just conversational, because that would, that would be really helpful. I love it. Second generation of Francophiles. It's going to happen. <laughs> got to put it out there. You are a delight. I love your work and I love you as a human. So thank you so much for sharing your story and for being so honest and about even the, the hard parts and the imposter syndrome. Oh, and the- thank you. Thank you, Amy. It's like such an honor to be on Clever. <laughs> you know, uh, because I've told you that I'm a like, super fan. So um, <laughs> keep doing this amazing show. And um, yeah, I hope that it helps people to hear that People are human and the world is is tough and also beautiful. Hey, thanks so much for listening. For more about John, including images of his work, dance career, and more, links to Coil and Drift and socials, a bonus Q&A, and a transcript of this episode, head to cleverpodcast.com. If you like Clever, there are a number of ways you can support us, and I hope you will. Share Clever with your friends, leave us a five-star rating or a kind review, support our sponsors and do hit the follow or subscribe button in your podcast app so that our new episodes will turn up in your feed. We love to hear from you on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. I'm sorry, X. You can find us at Clever Podcast and you can find me at Amy Devers. Please stay tuned for upcoming announcements and bonus content. You can subscribe to our newsletter at cleverpodcast.com to make sure you don't miss a thing. Clever is hosted and produced by me, Amy Devers, with editing by Mark Zorowinski, production assistance from Alana Nevins and Anushka Stefan, and music by L1011. Clever is a proud member of the Surround Podcast Network. Visit surroundpodcasts.com to discover more of the architecture and design industry's premier shows. These people have no idea. Like, I am going to be on Broadway.